Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly data talk, a show where we talk with data science leaders from around the world. Today is a really awesome topic. It's something we've never covered before on data talk. We're talking about voice and artificial intelligence. And we're super excited to have Katie McMahon. She's the vice president and general manager at SoundHound. And she previously served as the VP of business development at Shazam. Super excited to have Katie in the house today. Katie, how are you doing? Great, Mike. Thanks very much for having me. So um, Katie, we love to start these shows um, just talking openly about your kind of background and what led you to work at SoundHound. Sure, thanks. So um, I suppose what drives me is, is looking at where this next major um, user behavioral shift will, will go. And we all know now in hindsight that the touch, tap, and swipe era that the iPhone brought forward, the smartphone really shifted our behaviors from a PC-based world where we typed in search queries in um, a very entity detection type of way. We do everything on our phone, looking down and swiping and typing. Um, but about um, eight, nine years ago, I had a chance to meet with the founder of, of SoundHound Inc., Kayvon Moger, and he showed me a little glimpse of the future through what at the time was a, a prototype app that SoundHound Inc. had and it showcased the ability to say names from your contact and it would be able to call it. And it wasn't as simple as just saying, call John Smith. You could say um, you know, a slightly more um, unique name very quickly and it would still capture it in a voice recognition factor. And um, to me at that moment, I thought, wow, in the future, it might be that we use the air out of our lungs to interface with computing power. And if this company has the technical chops to become um, a leader in the space, that's what uh, really led me here. I think this is uh, an exciting spot to be for how we're going to interface with computing power. And how, how long ago was that, Katie? Yeah, I joined in the beginning of 2010. So you're right, I, I did wow. six years up Shazam in London. Prior to that, I was in the mobile space in Japan, um, in Tokyo and now here in Silicon Valley for the past uh, eight and a half years or so, growing growing this company from really a, a one product company that we had been known for in the music recognition space with the SoundHound Music app, and then more recently in the last um, two and a half, three years as we've unveiled really what took 10 years to build in stealth lab mode, mm -hmm. the voice AI platform of the Houndify platform. And that's where um, we're fully targeted on how do we enable companies to put a voice interface on their product, whether it's automotive, an appliance, and mobile application, robotics, et cetera. Um, that's what, what we're incredibly focused on. And our two BDC products are likewise, as we say, houndified. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, um, it's amazing that you were already getting into, you know, audio and voice AI back in the early days. Um, because even, even now, like I rarely use voice. And yeah. it was so cool before we went live here that you were showing me just an example of just your interaction yeah. with uh, this voice AI. And we'll, I'm sure we can talk to, do a demo here shortly, but um, I'm still like in the early yeah. days, I guess, because I'm still just like very much focused on typing. And so what has been like your kind of evolution as a user from you know the early days, like back in 2010, mm -hmm. like just starting out with you know voice AI and doing voice search to now, what's that evolution been like for you? Um, so I appreciate that you're you're very honest. You're already an yeah. early adopter by where you sit, right? And I think it's a great data point to say, you know, I, I'm still heavily on my habit of touch type yeah. and swipe. Um, the data points are coming out that those who are using um, the hardware, such as Google Home or the Echo, are increasingly becoming more comfortable with using their embedded digital assistants, right? So that's where the trend line is going. But when you ask me, me almost on a personal journey or a professional journey, where was I out in, in 2010 and, and seeing this, um, you know, it, in some ways it's fortuitous when you're intersecting with technologists who have the, the vision and the sight to be able to build the core technology, but I think the value that that one brings from seeing on a humanities-based level how this is going to impact um, end-user experiences. Mm -hmm. 
what we all know for the last 30 years, the experience of calling into a call center, right? Think back just 10 years ago when you oh, dialed gosh. up like, like you know, a, a bank or a travel <laughs> airline. It was a disaster. And we all know that we would shout and just say, operator, get me to what I want. It was always frustrating. And you're increasingly seeing those, those experiences improved. What's changing though it, it, to enable improved experiences, one, the automatic speech recognition. So the ASR level has improved to the point where the accuracy is getting really good. That's critical. But the more interesting thing is the, the science behind natural language processing or natural language understanding, the NLU side. So at SoundHound, what, what we did, and this isn't something that the, the experts in the field um, wouldn't have already been thinking. I think there was a lot of convergence in saying, what if you could combine the two steps? Meaning the two steps are, when, when you interface with any of the popular voice assistants, two, two things are happening. First, what you say gets transcribed. That's the automatic speech recognition. What did you say? That text line then gets thrown into an engine of NLU, trying to understand what did it mean? If you want two tickets to Toronto on September 22nd, there are a lot of twos in that. What, what did it mean? Now, there can be latency and errors, and then ultimately it falls over if there were errors in the first step. We combined uh, those two processes, and we've developed something called speech to meaning. Mm -hmm. This technology allows the end user to experience speed, accuracy, and ultimately delight. So that happens at a frame rate. The second very magical thing that we did was create an architecture of speech, um, deep meaning understanding. And that's allowing us to take discrete data sets and be able to, um, in, in many ways, cross-examine, cross if you will, and find out how to um, return results of compound complex queries. Hmm. You and I speak in compound complex queries. Like, what was the weather like, you know, what's the weather like tomorrow, and do you know of an Italian restaurant down the street? Hmm. Right, we, that's human behavior. And yeah, yeah. Speak. But for the decade where we learned how to type into a search box, our expectation was Italian restaurant, uh, maybe you'd say within five miles, maybe you'd say outdoor seating, but we built the voice AI um, architecture on the predication that you would want to be able to throw a lot at it, the compound complex side at it, and it needs to just work. And ultimately, that's the differentiator for Houndify that we've taken a lot of the heavy lifting away from ultimately a developer with the end goal that humans can just not have to use their own bandwidth to think about like, what do I need to say to make this work? And, and they can just um, interface with context awareness. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it's fascinating the work that you guys are doing because I, I guess like, one of the problems for me as a user of the voice assistant products that I've used, and I haven't used that many, but whenever I've done, um, I guess my my experience has been poor, and that's probably because I've just been not using great voice assistants or voice assistant technology. Like I've, I've still had those poor experiences on, um, I want to call it like a call center. Like I'm calling in for, like this recently I was calling in to change something on my healthcare card. You know, yeah. and I call the number 1-800, whatever. And I get into that phone circle, like dial, yeah. press one for this. And so some of these systems are just not equipped. Like they don't have that voice AI system that you're talking about, which is very impressive um, mm -hmm. when used properly. And so I think sometimes for many of us, like when we are thinking about, should I do the voice or should I just press yeah. the number? Like my, I'm just like geared to like, I'm gonna press the number because I know the voice is not gonna work. Right, yeah, your expectation is already so low. Yeah. So, you know, for for companies to win you back, it's going to require A, getting you to retry it once they've upgraded their systems. And you're using, you're calling out an example in the realm of customer support or call center. And I can tell you that every company that has those divisions is deeply um, incentivized because they know, one, it's all about the customer experience, but two, that's, a, that's an expense center. And when it's $5 a call, if mm -hmm. you can 
expense out and make it a more joyful experience, it's a double win. So you, you will start to see step changes with the call center experience. And I think um, it'll be night and day. Within, within five years, it'll actually be smooth, efficient. You might even prefer quick phone calls in versus going online and managing accounts the way you used to do. Right, but if you think about categories whereby a voice interface is absolutely tip of spirit and necessary, um, the car is one that we we feel strongly about. Um, mm -hmm. This is why we, you know, we, we recently did a major um, fundraising round, and strategic partners such as Tencent, Orange, and and Daimler came in. Right, so if you look at Daimler, thinking through, wow, this is interesting technology or Hyundai Motors, who showcased SoundHound Inc.'s technology in their future um, in-car dash experience. Because first off, our, our platform is allowing that end customer, so in that example, a Hyundai, to own the design, the customization, and ultimately the end user experience, the data, et cetera. Why would they want to send that up to um, a wonderful, great company in Seattle or in Cupertino or Mountain View when that, that could actually be scary for them, right? Soundonic is not going to become a car maker. We don't There. Oh no, so, we lost Katie. Oh, there you are. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> <laughs> Quick little intermission and we're back. <laughs> that, was, that was our commercial break. Okay. Now we're back. Katie. <laughs> yeah, I was just going on about um, the automotive space and why um, the, the voice AI that we really packaged up is so attractive to the likes of car makers. Because again, coming originally to your point that speaking isn't your natural habit yet. But I can tell you the connected car we all know is coming. That connected car will become the place you must first become naturally fluent, if you will, to interface with that thing. And that thing is a data moving machine now. So mm -hmm. the joy to be able to get in your car and be able to say, drive me to the nearest coffee shop except Starbucks. So you <laughs> and, and I, I use that very specific. Yeah, yeah. Exclusions are very hard. If you say that to, to Siri, it will drive you to Starbucks, right? Just as if you say, show me restaurants except Chinese because you ate Chinese all week. Um, the entity detection model, restaurant, Chinese, must be what you want. Again, that's almost one of the deep layers of um, technical challenges that we crack. We can have uh, exclusions. Um, yeah. And I guess, like, when I look at my kids, I mean, they're already, like, they prefer voice. Like, they don't want to type something in. Like, I see my kids and already, like, they're they're more likely to interact with Siri than I am because to them, Siri is very fun and they can do their queries that way. So I just see, like, the younger generation, they're already growing up expecting voice search yeah. to work right they are the voice first digital natives and it's generation v right six year old and below absolutely finds it um very easy to interface with it and they almost expect it right if you see a youngster who has grown up with a connected home device go into a, a you know a play structure <laughs> that has some analog thing that might say who wants to play hide and seek that child will say oh i do in a way expecting it to interact when that play mat is 15 years old and only runs on a battery that says, who wants to play hide and seek, right? And the, the light bulb just goes off. This generation will emerge just like the iPad generation, right? Any, any child who's 11 and up went to an old school ATM and tapped on it before they were all tappable, right? And yeah, uh, yeah. So you, you, you can learn so much by that young generation and from that, I'm really inspired as to, um, we're at the golden era. It, we're just at the cusp of what will become a golden era of, of VUI design, of voice user interface design. You know, I think uh, we could look to Apple as this company that produces gorgeous products, 
and very determined on the product design, the touch, the feel, and then the, 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 the GUI, right? The graphical user interface is what we've all gotten text next because we're, we're looking down at. <laughs> Going forward, I mean, it's gonna be a whole new suite of, um, uh, of thinkers and um, humanity-backed uh, skilled designers who think through per use case or a broader set of what should the experience feel like and Sanon Inc. is really proud to, in many ways, serve up the platform of technology to enable that. For example, we, we can allow brands to own their own voice. And, well, what does that mean? Right, right now, you know what Siri sounds like. You know what Alexa sounds like. Even our own voice search app called Hound has a certain voice sound to it, leveraged off of the, the native text-to-speech element of that device. But we work with on our on our platform. You can have um, you know an English male voice, a, a female Australian voice. These these are brand definers, and I think you're going to see brands take a big deep look on how to become unique, own their own voice, sound different, and really care about their customers. And only they know it. Um, and, and that's the joy of having a platform that serves up all those components, whether it's the best-in-class ASR, the NLU, the data sets, and the ability to have different languages, et cetera. It's, it's a sort of tipping point. And it's yeah. like, you say. <laughs> As you're talking, I'm just having like all these ideas and like thinking about my kids, like, Daddy, what was your first voice assistant? Like, who were you using? <laughs> no, in fairness, that, that's right. I mean, it's they their world in 20 years is, is going to be um, walking through the day very fluidly, being able to, in some ways, multitask by then off, offshooting, whether it's a utility factor or a quick information pool. You already see them have Siri as their homework completer or assistant. And again, that's why I, I think there's an amazing opportunity for um, thinkers to come into this space and hopefully make it make it great on child development. Yeah, I think that's, that's awesome. And I'm you know, I'm just thinking as a parent, I'm thinking, oh boy, I would really want like a kid friendly AI, voice AI to be working with my kids uh, when they're asking quick, you know, questions that making sure that the content that they're getting back is safe yeah. for kids. That's right. And there, there are some great companies, very, very focused, very specifically on the, um, even the auditory spectrum of, of children's voices um, and then the design of those experiences to be age appropriate. But uh, on the research side too, we, we know that play is so incredible for young developing children. They need full on imaginary play. Mm. And then we know there's the spectrum of engagement on an interface with a game where they're seeing something. So the emergence of a pure voice inter interface experience with child development is really relatively new. And um, some of the early uh, studies on it is showing that children they know that there is not a human behind it. So that they know it's not a human factor, but the fact that it answers back is now a new te territory, right? Like your teddy bear doesn't answer you back. You create the answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it, I, I think we need to be very aware of um, how this can have the impacts that were unknown yet. Yeah, with, yeah. Um, the physiological and psychological development of very young age, right? From age seven onward, I think there, there are different realms. But again, I should... You know, I'm not um, a specialist in this area. I'm sharing more or less personal point of view and, and from following some thinkers in this space. You know, there was a study in the UK that came out recently indicating that children that are growing up with Alexa, et cetera, are in fact coming into the classroom and uh, for lack of a better term, barking at their teacher, right? You're getting trained in part because of the failing of, from our perspective of needing to take your brain into a certain skill set modality and say it to make it work and then you get frustrated that it falls over if you're speaking mm -hmm. naturally and the fear that that comes back into the human dynamic of like i'm going to talk to mom and dad like that i'm going to talk to my mm -hmm. sister like that which is kind of cringeworthy um and it on a again on a personal level makes me feel like our mission at soundhound which is to houndify everything it is to on the human side allow us just to speak like you and i are having a conversation I wouldn't bark at you. Show me restaurant uh, Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Be friendly. Yeah. 
I, you know, it'd be conversational, and we can all say that query in tens of different ways, hundreds of different ways, and the techni technology behind the scenes simply needs to work. And to do all that has been a, uh, a life's mission for many of our scientists, programmers, engineers, product thinkers here. And we're really at the cusp of having designed something that is not just faster and better, but it's truly a step change in the whole spectrum of voice AI. So um, my hope is that we go fast enough so that as the natives are coming up speaking it, meaning the voice natives that don't need to, you know, so they get trained to speak yeah. as closely as you and I do at a dinner table. Yeah, I, I can't wait for that moment because right now I feel like search engines have taught me to like speak in keyword phrases. Right, like if I'm gonna type into uh, Siri or uh, talk to Google search, like I'm gonna talk in keyword phrases, right? That's right, we call that Tarzan speak. And <laughs> that's exactly it is. The, the thesis whereby we're, we're going orth orthogonally. Like we do not want you to have to do the processing work. You should not have to break down your thought process into a query in an entity detection format. That is yesteryear. Thank goodness for the world's information being organized and searchable. We're forever grateful for that. The voice interface era, we hope, needs to be a place where conversational, context aware, the ability to ha handle compound complex queries enables us to have just a much more real, delightful, and evolutionarily co correct way to, 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 to do it, right? So. Um, and I think really just the point when you talk to a technology company like ourselves, how did we do it? Like what goes into it? What are the data sets that belie this great conversation, you know, the great experience you're, you're telling us about? Yeah, yeah. Um, and and maybe, I, maybe I should drill into that since the audience is, is curious. Yeah, go for it, Katie. About, um, you know, part of the Houndify platforms, um, what would I like to say, it's smartly architected such that data sets can be added into the platform and then ultimately um, be interwoven. So what do I mean by that? If we, um, so for example, we have, we've partnered with Yelp and Uber and Expedia. So in, in those categories, those, those data sets are searchable. So if I just, it, let me just do this so that people understand that, right? If I open up our Hound app, it's a, it's a free download. So Hound is our voice search and assistant app. Let's say I want to look for a restaurant nearby. Um, I would used to think about it in filtering, like I want this and I don't want that. It needs to be have outdoor seating. Now just say it. Show me Italian restaurants within 10 miles that are open right now and have outdoor seating. Okay. Here are several Italian restaurants within 10 miles that are open now that have outdoor seating. Fantastic. So that query, we processed it in speech to meaning real time hitting yeah. against Yelp's data set that matched the criteria, I could say, okay, Hound, only show those that are kid-friendly. Okay, here are several Italian restaurants that are kid-friendly. Oh, wow. I'm refining, I'm now, okay, perfect. I could ask I could ask it to tell me about the first one, or I could simply say, right, I need to get there. I'm gonna grab three colleagues, we're gonna go to lunch. I need an Uber to the first one. So, it's, it's now, I need an Uber to the first one. From sure. this, an Uber next can take you from here to one first street, Los Altos. Oh, that's, that is awesome. Dollars to 22. So that, it retained, it understood, but we went over and we hit the Uber data set real time, right? So this is, this is us mm. fluidly allowing the data behind the scenes to work as the end user would just anticipate it. I didn't need to stop and open a new skill and then say, right, and that's, that's right. So when another data set comes on, right, say you're, you're gonna go up to Seattle tomorrow night on a business trip, show me hotels in Seattle with availability tomorrow night, less than $400, but more than 150 that have a pool and free Wi-Fi. <laughs> availability okay. in Seattle for tomorrow, September 14th, between this. 150 like, US dollars and 400 US dollars per night that have a swimming pool and provide free Wi-Fi. Okay. But I don't want to be out in Bellevue. So let's say, okay, only show those within two miles of the Space Needle. 
Okay, showing 10 results within two miles of Space Needle. Oh, okay. wow. Space Needle wasn't, I didn't give an address. I gave a, a yeah. interest. Now, now I can say, okay. Okay, Hound, what's the weather like there? The weather is 61 degrees and cloudy near Space Needle. Context aware. It knows I love that. Aware. Not talking about Santa Clara. Now let's throw a quirky thing into it. Don't show anything that doesn't have air conditioning. Okay, showing 10 results that have air conditioning. It understood you must still want to go back to that hotel domain, even through that negation in there, which is complicated. And boom, I'm back in there. Like, this is the future of how we're oh, going. Wow. To You're not going to spend 20 minutes drilling down on, like, I need a pet friendly gym that has free Wi Fi and a pool with it. Just say what you want, get it. And over the course of your year as a business traveler, you'll save three hours of time back. And and then even like flight status, this will showcase a conversational state. If I want to say, um, you know, uh, what's my flight status? Now it's not going to know. Let me let me start over. If I um, am running to the airport and let's say I I I'm, what's my flight status? What is the airline of the flight? Southwest Airline. Okay, using the airline Southwest Airlines. What is the flight number? You can also say, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, no problem. Which city are <laughs> the flight departing from? San Jose, California, going to LAX. Found nine matches for Southwest Airlines flight from San Jose, California. Oh, wow. To International Airport. This is beautiful, but you, you use this one all the time. You normally, you're running the airport. What's yeah. my flight status? Southwest Airlines going blah, 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 and it'll show you, and it'll show you the gate real time. But in the examples of like not knowing all the information, this is where our ability to have a conversational state is really important. And this is going to be where the brands light up and the designers light up. Because for example, um, inside of Hound, you can, you can do your own mortgage calculation. And, but if you don't give all the data points, it's going to say, you know, what's your down payment? What's the interest rate? And then you can keep that data set and change and say, well, how about for a $550,000 house at a 4.2% interest rate, and it'll come right back. And that's where I think we really can showcase um, a step change in anything anyone's seen in voice AI um, as a live platform. I, I love those examples, the, the contextual search, how it remembers the previous conversations and can instantly keep refining your search to help, help you. That, that is beautiful. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's our hope that, um, again, it almost unencumbers you um, to not have to become the machine. Yeah, and I, and I like also that you're not having to constantly refer to a certain skill. Right. It's just finding it for you that's right. and you pulling that information in. Yeah, exactly. You don't have, you know, um, and, and even for the training wheels inside of Hound, you know, on the home screen, it goes through all the different data sets that we have. So again, to your audience, who's probably curious on, well, how do you know, it, like, um, what time is it in Tokyo and London when it's 4 p.m. here? Right. It is 8 a.m. the next day in Tokyo and 12 a.m. the next day in London when it is 4 p.m. here. It's joyful. This is a joyful one because we have a teammate in, in Tokyo and, and sometimes you want to figure out your 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 time zone. But if you ask that against the the giants, they, they fall over. They, they can't mm. handle the simple to end user. Why can't you be able to just ask that? nutritional weather, a beautiful one is, you know, what's the wind speed by the Golden Gate Bridge at 8 p.m. tonight? Right. The wind will be 12 miles per hour from the west near Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> I, I love how, Katie, how quick that is. I mean, it's instantaneous. I mean, you ask it, and the beautiful part is you're not going to type anything in. You're, you're, at, you're thinking it and asking it at the same time and immediately getting the response. Right. And I that, love how fast it is too. Yeah. Like the language is even fast. That that part is the speech to meaning in action, right? Because we're real time processing, so that when my mouth shuts, here comes the answer. It's, you know, we have a classic example. Our our, our founder that did this like early on, and we all were just mind, like our mind went crazy. It, it you wouldn't ask this every day, but it really shows the power of it if you ask. What's the population of Japan and China? And what languages are spoken in India? What's the capital of Bermuda? What's the area code of Ireland? The population is 127,288,000 for <laughs> 1,330,044,000 for China. The list of languages of India is Indian English. Hindi. What? 
The capital of Bermuda is Hamilton. <laughs> right, like so that's where your brain needs to be like, I I would fall over in my confidence if I was <laughs> that surge and boom, here's the power of what Houndify and voice AI technology, the the the, the science breakthroughs, and they did, in fairness, they really took 10 years. They were steps forward and there are massive setback, et cetera. So I think I just underscore that it's non-trivial. This isn't, in fairness, um, a new viral social app that will mm -hmm. be broken mm -hmm. by a viral marketer, right? It's it's core technology that is um, a deep, several discrete deep scientific sciences, um, but we've, we've architected it such that it doesn't take scientists anymore to build onward. It's developers from here on out that can build forward and then we can't wait for the design thinkers from each one of these companies. And pragmatically, we're sitting down and, and we're working with them all, right? So we have um, major enterprise companies across the verticals of automotive, robotics, mobile apps, services, appliances, healthcare, financial that come to us, explain their scenario and we, we drill in. Um, it's the companies that aren't thinking about it that I worry about. They, mm -hmm they'll be left behind. They, you really need to lean into this pretty quickly, just like had you not leaned into a mobile app experience, you you wouldn't you'd just be irrelevant today. Yeah, I, I just think about the future of work as we began using more AI, like everyone, we're gonna start using more AI in our workplaces and having a voice enabled system like this where I can quickly retrieve things. Like I was just thinking about as you're playing this, like, oh, how great would it be to be at work and be able to like, talk to the AI and say, can you find me that conversation in Slack that we had about this project yeah. three weeks ago? And if for it to find it instantly, you need to tell me in audio what happened or summarize it, right? Absolutely, the efficiency that brings to its, its voice search in that example, quickly harness the data so that my, my real value brain power can be moving forward on this task. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I just, so where do you see, um, where do you see this going like in the next five to 10 years as voice yeah. search and AI is getting better? Yeah. So that question, it's, it's loaded. It's a complicated, to, to answer it deeply is, um, there's not a cheap and cheerful answer. I think in some ways if we step back and consider what we're starting to see evolve, it's a framework of, of um, almost two circles. One is, do you bolt on a voice assistant to your thing? And you'll see that. You'll see certain products slap on Alexa because it's a known quantity and it's understood you speak to it. And then you'll see other entities that think through on a, on a voice interface level. Like how, do I interact, how do I achieve interaction through a voice interface? And then there'll be a, a small overlap on the Venn diagram of, um, a voice assistant and it's full on um, voice capabilities on, on that experience, right? So I think the world will move forward with several assistants moving forward that are already quite dominant, but there's absolutely a realm for um, each major brand service thing in your life to capture that fidelity. And I think you need to really look through who's at risk of their brand identity disappearing when they're utilized through voice interfacing, right? When you can't see green or blue or red pop up at you, um, that's dangerous for a brand marketeer, right? You need to think through literally what's the auditorial experience? Am I an upbeat and crazy and energetic type of experience? Am I a soothing one? Am I a utility voice? All of that bundles into whether end users are going to adopt, use, et cetera. But by far, the, the thing has to work, right? And that's where if you're really good that we've got the technology confidence of saying we'll produce uh, results for your query. And then on top of it is that beautiful icing of differentiated branded experience, which has the capability to retain loyal customer fidelity, right? Like how do you keep that customer base? Otherwise, you know, it's the scary thing of do you become a dumb pipe for services? You know, I think about the music streaming services, right? Like they, they could all be relegated to utility unless mm -hmm. they're in it in, in a voice um, interaction space, for example. 
automotive, another one. They, they, it will be a buying factor, how great voice interfacing of the car dashboard will be. No doubt. I mean, that's the place where we're going to be using voice the most, I think, in our day. For those that drive a lot, when we're in our car, it's much safer, right, to be calling things out by voice than having to, we shouldn't be, you know, texting or doing search unless we're stopped. That's right. And I think you'll, you'll also see um, a, a tailwind here. Uh, the Georgia state law, for example, has, has gone full throttle. Like no, no touching, no interacting. It's just really, truly hands-free. So I think we, it'll be interesting to watch how much more rapidly cars that have phenomenal embedded voice inter interfacing experiences will win because of it. Mm -hmm. right? I think there might be an interesting parallel. Do you, do you remember when, when Apple did the phenomenal, there's an app for this campaign, really introduced. <laughs> That's right. There were yeah. a couple apps that literally people, I mean, I had people feedback, like I bought the phone because of that magical app. Like, you know, of course it didn't, <laughs> that was an outlier experience, but I'm, I'm just going to the point that that step change of experience, I think we're gonna see it in the car and that cars that do this right in their connected sense will help us get rid of the touch my phone habit. Yeah. And they really hope we, we add to um, safety in cars. Uh, Katie, before we go, um, can you talk to the business leaders and data scientists that are out there that are working on projects and they're thinking, you know what, I need to start incorporating voice AI into my project. What sorts of advice do you give them and also um, how can they get in touch with you at SoundCloud? I'm sorry, SoundCloud. Thank you. Thanks. So um, our, our platform is open, and really the first pragmatic step is to go to houndify.com, and there's a seamless registration. For free, you can be developing and using this stuff. I mean, we, we actually give a long leash of free usage before um, you'd ever have to be charged something. You know? So... Already today, you can tinker around with it. You can play with it. You can get in touch with us through either our SoundHound Inc., you know, our SoundHound.com page, or Houndify.com page, or follow us directly on our social channels. Um, on the on the data side, you know, I think this is where it becomes really interesting. We, we're a company that understands un, unstructured data, structured data. How do we clean this up? How do we make it, you know, ultimately um, usable? AI is nothing but, you know, I heard this said yesterday. It, really IA, and that's the infrastructure architecture of, mm. um, of the data that sits behind it. So data data is gold, and our, our platform enables what we call a collective AI, so that when data gets put up there, if that owner chooses to make it extensible, you might have an onward distribution, right? So the likes of um, Uber or Yelp data, any new developer, that, that car manufacturer that's about to roll off, Houndified, can tick the box and make sure that goes live. So if new data sets are going up, they can they can really be having endpoints of end users through the uh, manufacturers that we will be shipping with. Wonderful. Um, for those listening to the podcast, if you'd like to watch the video or read the full transcript of today's episode, you can go to ex.pn slash data talk 62. Again, that's ex.pn slash data talk 62. And if you'd like to connect with Katie, learn more about the work that they're doing, uh, definitely check out houndify.com. You can also go to soundhound.com, spelled S-O-U-N-D-H-O-U-N-D.com. Uh, Katie, thank you so much for sharing about the work you're doing and just all the awesome things that are happening with Soundhound. Thank you, Mike. You've made this a really enjoyable conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.